I'm Lisa Van Gammer, and I want to share with you some tips on using this editable frames resource. Now, if you have this resource, then you probably will want some tips because it's about 40 pages long. There are seven pages in it that are tips and information for you, and so you don't have to keep coming back and watching the video over again, although you're welcome to. You're going to get tips and specific directions for how to use not only frames in general, but also this specific resource. So just in case you're not familiar with depth and complexity, I thought it might be helpful to do a very, very brief reminder of what it is. So the depth and complexity framework is a pedagogical framework and it's designed to raise thinking levels of students in a class, whether they're general education students, gifted and talented students, special education students, depth and complexity is perfect for all of your students. And most people, when they think of depth and complexity, think about a set of 11 thinking prompts that are represented by an image. I use emoji, you may have seen the icons, doesn't really matter what image you're using, the important part is the thinking that is behind that prompt. And so those thinking prompts give students different lenses through which they can approach content. So those 11 thinking prompts that you may be familiar with are these. Now, this resource does not actually teach depth and complexity. It assumes that you know a little bit. If you don't, I'll share with you how you can learn more. So what are frames in particular? Well, they're the only activity specific depth and complexity thing. Uh, by that, what I mean is that depth and complexity is primarily about what students are thinking, not necessarily what they're doing. Depth and complexity works with any classroom activity. But frames are something that are specific to depth and complexity. And so what they consist of is essentially the same thing as you would see with picture frame where there's something in the middle and then there's a mat and a frame around it and basically the students then will be focusing on whatever is in the middle through the thinking that they're demonstrating around this outside now you're going to see in this video that there are lots of different iterations of that and then the center may be very very small maybe have nothing in it other than words um, that are like the title of what it is they're framing and that's perfectly fine so I want to show you a couple of examples of frames that I've created to use with students. So this one is from the set that I have of um, a set of frames of the year, like a year of depth and complexity frames that correspond to those commemorative months that we celebrate, like Women's History Month and Asian Pacific Islander Month. And so what you can see here in this frame is that I've got part of the center is an image, a picture, and then there's some text about that. And then around the frame, there are task statements that give students information and ask them a question and give them the instruction of what they're going to do in that section of the frame. And so the student can tell where they're supposed to write because if you look at this one on top, you'll see that embedded question mark. And then over in the upper left of that section of the frame, a corresponding question mark and so then they know okay not only is it right next to that section but also they're looking to match those images now you'll see that this frame isn't actually centered on the page and the reason for that is that I've got more text on the left side than on the right and so uh, I need the frame to be shifted over to make space and so in this resource, these frames are completely editable and I'll show you that. And so what that means is that you can shift these frames all around the page to match what you have typed. Here's another example. This is from my end of school year depth and complexity pack. And you'll see here that in the center, I've got a bunch of text. This is just instruction in the middle. I've actually got the title of the frame up at the top. And it's about the idea of where do the dog days of summer come from? Hint, there's a little bit of a Harry Potter connection here. And so you can see that um, one thing you'll notice is in the bottom left, that that task statement on the left actually has two depth and complexity prompts, not just one. And that's perfectly fine to do. You're not limited to a single one in a task statement. I would never do more than four task statements to a frame, but it's fine to have more than one thinking prompt in a task statement. And you can see an example here of how that would look. 
So you can have frames that look like this. You can have frames that look like this. You've just seen a couple that look like this. The ones you've seen are in this portrait mode, right? But you can use them either landscape or portrait. You may do a square, a square frame. You can have circles, you can have ovals, you can have anything that you like. So let's look at what you have in this particular resource of editable frames. You've got 23 different blank frames to choose from. So you've got, when I say different, I mean unique in either shape, the number of sections. I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you a bunch of them you're gonna get a wide variety of shapes and styles. So you can see some here on the, will be like the one on the left that are more traditional kind of rectangle frame. You're gonna get some frames that are circles. This one only has three sections instead of four. You'll notice that they've got different layouts as far as like the one on the right, it says insert title or topic here. And then there's space at the bottom. There's a text box at the bottom where you could put in the task statement for what you want in the middle, or maybe even a reflection question or information for students to read. Now, all of this is editable, and so you're going to be able to delete any text boxes you don't want to use. You're gonna be able to type whatever you want to in the text box. You're gonna be able to insert images or other information on top of it as, as you wish. Oh, like a princess bride, as you wish. So here are a couple more that you're going to get. There's this design on the left I call pinwheel, where the space for the task statement is embedded right in the frame, that's fine. You're gonna get some related to cycle. There are like three, I think, different cycle frames. And you'll notice lots of different iterations in this. You'll see on the one here on the right that the center is really nothing more than a, a space to type something. They're all so editable. So I just took a screenshot of what the PowerPoint looks like. And um, so every all these text boxes, as I mentioned, are editable. The frames are movable all around the page. The only thing you can't change is that the name and the date are there. And then the and, and, and if you don't want those, cover it up with a white shape. That's fine. And then also the copyright symbol and that you cannot change. Um, so then over to the right, off to the side of the PowerPoint, and that's why this is in a PowerPoint, not a PDF, is because you can edit this in PowerPoint. And so off to the side, you're gonna see that there's gonna be all of the emoji that go with the thinking prompts, and actually you're gonna have the names of the thinking prompts next to them, and then you're gonna have this black line, and that black line is movable, you can shift it over. You know what, let me go back so you can see why you might want to do that. Um, you, you'll see in this one where I have this black line to create kind of an enclosure for that emoji that I used to represent that thinky prompt. So that's why I included that black line for you. So let me go back where we were. Okay, here we go. Now, you may want to replace the font. I've used Century Gothic, which is a font that I really like for students. It's got a nice clean A. Um, which my nemesis Comic Sans does not have. Um, but if you don't like com if you don't like Century Gothic, you want to use a different font. All you need to do is on the Home tab, go over to where the Find is, and below that is Replace. When you click on that, then you'll see a drop down Replace Replace Fonts. Choose Replace Fonts, and you'll need to highlight some text when you do this. So highlight some of the text inside one of the text boxes, and then that Replace Fonts will pull up and you can choose the font that you want to replace Century Gothic with. If you do it this way, it'll replace it in the entire document. So if you only wanna do it in one section, just highlight that text and use the font drop down menu to choose the font you want for that spot. But if you wanna replace the font for the whole slide deck, that's where you do it. There are several done for you frames that are included. And this is so you can get an example for a couple of different types of frames for what you might want to do. So I've got one for kinder here that you can see where it's, what are, what are kindergartners able to do with a frame? I've got a math example, and you'll see that here in the center, there are a couple of images of dollar bills. That's because they're gonna analyze the dollar bill through the lens of the number 13. 
And then here you've got a language arts one. Now the language arts one is part of a set that is available. The um, depth and complexity language arts frames, the ELA done for you frame. Um, the other two are ones I'm working on. So at the time of recording, they're not available, but when they are, I'm sure you'll know, make sure that you're following me. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. You're also going to get a rubric so that you can quickly evaluate the frames that your students complete. So let's look at some of the things you could do with a frame. One thing I love to do with frames is to use them for direct instruction. So you can see on this one that there's a lot of text on here. I've shifted the frame over to the side. I'm teaching. I'm teaching within the frame. And I love doing this when I have a sub. I'm not leaving just a worksheet. It feels like something real, but I'm not depending upon the sub to do the direct instruction. The students have it built right in. So handy. Another thing I like to do in the center of a frame is to put in a template for a big idea. So big idea is the thinking prompt of depth and complexity that says, okay, now that you've read all about this, now that you've learned all about this, now that you've studied about this, now that you've heard about this, now that you've analyzed this, what can you say about it that you were not able to say before this learning experience? The, the big idea is the so what, right? It's the concluding sentence of an essay. It's like, because we've proven all of this or because we've learned all of this, now we know X, right? Now the difficulty is students often have trouble coming up with quality big ideas. And so a templated sentence in the center is a really good use of that center of the frame. And you can, and you can see that here. If you want to differentiate that, which I encourage you to do, then you might have this for your highest level learner. You may have a few more words put in for your on-level learners. And then you may have a word bank for your students who need the most support. One other thing I highly recommend, and this is another example from my end of year depth and complexity pack. This is from the language arts one, and so is this. But in the back or the end of year pack, I have this one, which is such a good example of how I used images to reinforce the teaching. In this case, they're learning about the summer solstice. This is a science standard. They're learning the standard and they need to understand what it means about the tilt of the earth on its axis and in relationship to the sun. Like what, what is going on here? And so these images in here are not just to make the frame look good, which let's admit they do make the frame look good, but that's not their main purpose. Their main purpose is to reinforce learning and to assist in the learning. So this one is an example of how I can have a very brief piece of reading that they might do. Now you can have longer reading. If you wanted students to do longer reading and then do a frame, it can be a a separate book, right? They've read a story, they've read a book, you've read a book to them, they've listened to a story, whatever. They've read a piece of content from the textbook or on a website, and then they're going to do a frame about it. That's fine. But you can also just stick in a paragraph, or maybe you want a page, you could just print it on the back of the frame. Or if you've put the frame up into like Google Slides, then you can then put a page of text in there, or they can read a piece of analog text and then go add it in the Google frame, in the frame that's on a Google slide. So, so many options for you to give them a piece of text to, to analyze. But if you do it right on the same page as a frame, it makes for a really nice little analysis activity. Remember, you're going to get seven pages of tips and information. And I think this page is one that will really help you. It takes you step by step of how to create a frame and then examples like down at the bottom, like put this here, put this here. You'll turn to this page again and again. So what if you wanna learn more about depth and complexity? The first thing I would suggest is subscribe on Gifted Guru. So giftedguru.com slash subscribe will take you there. Subscribe, I'm constantly sending out, not constantly, like not 10 times a day, but like once a week or so, you'll get an email from me with something related to teaching. And if I know that you're interested in depth and complexity, then you'll get all the stuff related to depth and complexity whenever I have something new, whenever I have a freebie that's come out about it, whatever, um, tips about depth and complexity, whatever, you'll get those so make sure you subscribe but you have a link in the resource to the section of my website that is all depth and complexity and that is getting bulked up all the time so there's so much free information for you there 
that you can get. So follow along there. If you want resources that are already done for you, I definitely have that and there's a link to it in your resource. But I definitely have resources that I create for you because number one, I literally wrote the book about the complexity with my friend Ian. Um, but number two, I know how little time you have and so I wanna make things easier for you. And so you can find very reasonably priced resources for depth and complexity. There are guides. So there is the whole book, the Depth and Complexity book that Ian and I wrote. And then there's a quick guide and there's a question sums guide. So there's a couple small guides that you can get. And if you really want to know about Depth and Complexity, the mother load is in the course. And there's a huge discount coupon code in the resource to be able for you to take this course for a lower price. Or maybe your district has a district license for the course. But this is like if you really want to up your depth and complexity game, I've poured everything I know about it into here. Um, and so if you have a question about depth and complexity, or if you have a question about this resource or a question about gifted education in general, um, then please hit me up. You can email me, lisa at giftedguru.com. And you can also just slide into my DMs on Instagram. Those are the two best ways to reach me. So I hope that you enjoy this resource, this resource, and I hope I can't, I really can't wait to see what you create with these depth and complexity frames. So good luck to you with these frames and in your depth and complexity practice.